Hey, yo, we live on the K Sweet Show podcast today. I have a special guest for you, my guy, the one and only Ian Marco. How you doing, brother? I'm doing well, man. I'm really excited to be here. Really excited to be talking to you. Yeah, same here, same here, brother. Yo, first and foremost, I uh, appreciate you taking the time to make this podcast happen. Um, for those that don't know, I initially created this podcast for my French speaking followers. And, uh, you know, for the past few months, I've been thinking about transitioning and, you know, having a few of my favorite uh, English speaking practitioners, but I was constantly putting it off. And, you know, God works in mysterious ways. I guess you sent me that message the other day and, uh, you know, we make it happen. So, so I'm, I'm grateful for that, man. So yeah, I like to oh, say that again. I said, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You push me once again. So um, I like to give a little background story where I met my guest and the funny thing is that we actually never met in person. We got to yep. connect via social media, which is a cool thing about Instagram. And, uh, you know, I've always uh, liked your work. You constantly put out, you know, good content, quality content. And I have to say that you have been a source of inspiration. I've seen you killing the game, grow your social media following. So, you know, I'm grateful for that as well. So for those that don't know you, uh, could you give... Um, could you give, could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about where you're from and who you are? Absolutely, man. And uh, first and foremost, again, thank you so much for having me on. I feel the same way, man. Your stuff's really inspiring. I mean, you know, I'm just a trainer. You're a, a, a model, a, uh, a high jumper, an athlete. You got splits. You know, the, the, the truth is I'm catching up to you, man. But either way, I appreciate you having me on. I appreciate the kind words. Um, so I'm a personal trainer. Um, I also work in kind of like a, a gray area that we both kind of do in some ways of like that rehab kind of, you know, some people may have seen some physical therapists and it didn't work out and then they kind of come to us. Um, so there, there's that. Um, but I'm basically based out of Miami right now. I spent five years in New York City where I, I grew a lot, learned a lot, uh, worked at Google, worked at Goldman Sachs. So I, I've been at a couple of different places uh, along the journey. And now I'm in Miami. My brother and I run an online business where we do online education for trainers we also do online education just for you know average people or general population in terms of improving mobility improving strength um, I would say one of the things that maybe uh, kind of separates me or, or defines me is the ability to um, try my best to not be biased into one system or one approach and the ability to kind of integrate and bring together multiple systems into one basically the analogy of just you have a toolbox as many tools as you have the more people you're going to be able to help and um, being able to kind of choose the right tool is something that I'm always working on getting better at that's 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 dope man and it's true there's something that uh that I really like about you but I will touch on that on uh, in a minute so you said you were in the corporate world before right so what got you started in the fitness industry so when I say I'm in the corporate world, that means that I worked at the gym within Goldman Sachs, which is a, oh, okay. you know, one of the biggest banks in the world. And then Google is Google, um, you know, working at the gym there. So I wasn't necessarily in corporate. I was in corporate wellness, I guess is what you would say. Um, but it was really as simple as, man, when I first got to New York, I was broke. Uh, I was out of a job. I didn't have anything. And uh, mm -hmm. I got in an elevator with this one guy and he basically said, oh, you look like a trainer. And I was like, yeah, I am. And he's like, all right, well, you want to come work at uh, Goldman Sachs and teach classes? And I was like, yeah. And then it was a wrap after that. I just rose up and then eventually moved on from them because just like, you know, you know, anywhere that you're at, it's it's really easy for it to get stagnant and um, kind of hit the ceiling, especially when you're working for other people, which I know you know that. So it's yeah. uh, it's uh, that, that's kind of what happened with the corporate stuff. I see, I see. So when when did you leave New York? I uh, left New York in September, not last September, but the one before. So it's been a little bit over a year since I've uh, been to my, been living in Miami again. I was originally born in Miami, but it came back and now I'm living here again. Okay. So see, do you miss New York? Because I was there at the same time when we kind of connected and uh, I miss New York every single day, but I don't know how you feel about that. I sure do, man. I really miss New York a lot. I think it's the worst place in the world that you could be right now, personally, um, yeah. because of COVID. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like I got out at the right time. Uh, I want to be a snowbird. So I want to like have a place in Miami and have a place in New York eventually. But um, for right now, it's just Miami is just such a better place to be. I mean, most people that live in New York are moving to Miami, honestly. Like, exactly, I see exactly. People every day. So, but I love New York, man. There's nothing like it. That energy. I know you as a hustler can can um, you know really feel that too. It, it just it's such a uh, such a unique place. It's still the best city in the world, if you ask me. 
Definitely, definitely. I can only agree with you. So, so yeah, uh, there's something I really like about you. Like you said, you mentioned it before, but you are not dogmatic about any training modality and uh, you constantly learning. I see you uh, taking new courses, you know, learning new stuff. And I think that's what most trainers should do anyways. I kind of have the same approach. Uh, like you said, it's about adding more tools to your toolbox so that you can uh, provide the best uh, service to your clients. And so I have a few questions. Um, wh what does your uh, learning process look like? Like, are you the type of guy that comes across a, a training modality and you're like, mm, that doesn't really resonate with me um, so that I want to learn more about it? Or are you more like, kind of like me, where you're like, mm, this initial message kind of makes sense. So I want to dig deeper. I'm curious to know more about that. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, um, you know, with the way that it's all set up, I think you, it's inevitable that you're going to end up aligning yourself with the guru um, or the leader of that, that system. So obviously I'm sure you remember like listening to Dre talk for the first time. It was just like, man, like I, I just can't deny this stuff. Like I've seen it. I've had my clients struggle with it and this just speaks to me. So I'm the type of person that just wants to dive in. I'm very excessive. I'm very um, all in. So like when I found FRS, I wanted to know everything about FRS. Like I even did FR lower because I was like, maybe this is going to be something I can do even though I don't put my hands on people. So, right. you know, I'm very much diving in. Um, I don't like to read. So that's a big thing. Uh, like I, <laughs> I realized lately, like I kept struggling to finish books and like read. And then I just switched to audiobooks, And now like, I'm just like killing them. I'll go for a walk, do some zone two. And like audiobooks are just flying now. So like, <laughs> that's definitely a big part of my learning process. Um, but I also like to just talk to other people. And actually, I'm very much about applying it which is good and bad, you know, because, you know, applying some things that you might not understand can go wrong. But at the same time, when we're talking about the things we are like, compared to someone doing a really heavy deadlift or them learning how to do a shoulder car, like don't get into a pinching sensation and you're going to be good. You know, like it really is low risk. Same thing with like the PRI stuff and some of maybe like the flowability stuff that I've been learning and using. It's like, you can learn how to apply that stuff by doing it. And when it is such a low risk thing, you don't have to really worry about it. The biggest risk would be that you're wasting your time or wasting your client's time, which is also absolutely essential. Um, but really I'm all about diving all the way in, learning through actually applying it definitely a, a millennial in terms of video and audio being a little bit better for me than than, than reading but um i try to read too so that, that's how i would answer that mm -hmm. for sure for sure yeah it's true that i think it's very important to you know um practice the stuff you learn uh, on yourself first so uh, how long because you've been practicing different you know uh training modalities like i said so how long do you practice for before you feel confident to to say okay now i can teach it yeah i think it's an individual circumstance but um like and i think that's also a great point and something that i probably should have even said like you said like you really start working on yourself so like even before i mean i remember back in the day like i remember seeing um like either hunter or someone else like do like a hip car or shoulder car up against the wall and i was immediately i'm the first person that just goes and starts to try to do it myself obviously right. looking back it was like the most heinous car you've ever <laughs> seen in my in your life right. but at the same time you learn from doing it like that i don't know if there's an exact point where it's like hey i feel comfortable to just really start working on this. I think it's an individual circumstance, just mm -hmm. like you would get an FRA of someone and say, hey, like, all right, this person might need something different than the other person. Um, but there's definitely a substantial amount of, uh, you know, practice that goes in with myself first before I start doing it. Um, luckily, what I usually end up doing is I'm already like lost and, you know, finding my way before I even actually get to the educational resource so that when I get there, I feel kind of ahead of the group in terms of what I'm learning um, so, cause I've already kind of dove into it. So, so much head first. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, for sure. I think, I think like, I, I, I like to say that we are, uh, we are the first Guinea pigs, right? So that's how it yeah. should be. You should practice on yourself first and then you, you can't eventually practice uh, on your clients and you will make mistakes along the way. It's part of the process and that's how you learn. So I apologize to all my clients. Cause I know back in the days I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> But that, that's how, you know, when you look back, you're like, oh, God, that was really yeah, bad. I can't believe I did that. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe I was doing that. But, hey, that's, that's, that's how we learn, and it's part of the process. So, you know, um, and so, so, you know, like, you touched on something important. Um, how important for you, how important is it to um, actually go and take the course yourself instead of just, you know, watching stuff on social media? Because this is something we see a lot on, on especially with the, the FRC world. 
I see a lot of people, they just watch something on social media, on Instagram. They're, they're like, mm, I got it. I get the concept. So what would you say to those people? Yeah, that's a really great question. And I think I'm a really good person to ask about that because while I don't teach FRC or teach FRS stuff, um, in terms of like, I've, you can't come to me to learn FRC. I do use, um, you know, things that I've learned from them. I definitely teach cars here and there, you know, so like I do teach a small piece of that. And I would be one of the people that maybe you would not go to FRC and think, oh, I can just get off by learning this. But the first thing that I'm going to tell you is you can't replace FRS stuff. You can't replace going to FRC. You can't replace listening to Dre. You damn sure can't replace listening to Chivers and Dre was listening to my ass. That's yeah. for, sure. <laughs> for sure. So I would say that it's absolutely crucial to go to the courses. Um, it was actually crucial to get it from the first hand because what you see is a lot of disconnect on, on social media. There's a lot of people that make assumptions about what Dre and what FRS says. And then when you actually are in the circle or when you actually take the time to learn about it, you realize like that's absolutely not what they said, especially putting extra words like, uh, you know, just thinking about prerequisites like, oh, Dre said to not deadlift. He, Dre never said not to deadlift. He just yeah. said, hey, there's a lot of reasoning why this might be more important than you doing deadlifts right now. Or maybe you should prepare yourself better before you start deadlifting. But like that gets lost in translation. So that's why I think it's really important to go to the source. Everybody that takes my Mobility Coach Plus course, I, I say it throughout the whole entire course. Like This doesn't replace FRC and you should definitely go take it as soon as you can. So I think it's crucial to get to the original source and to look beyond the original source and challenge them completely because challenging your mentors, your gurus and, and everybody you're learning from is I think equally important. Even if you challenge them and then you do a full circle and end up back where you started and say, hey, they were right. Now I know even right. more than I knew before. I think that's a really powerful moment in the learning process as well. For sure, for sure. And, and you know, it's funny because you know, you, you just said it, uh, you shouldn't like be listening to people as if they were gurus. And that's what I did back in the days. I mean, it was part of my growth as a, a trainer, you know, back in the day, I, said, I remember I was listening to Charles Polyquin taking his classes, his courses and stuff. And he, he said a bunch of good stuff, but he was saying a bunch of stupid shit as well, you know? Yeah. And uh, so, but, and he was very like talking in absolutes, saying, with, using blank, uh, blanket statements, Say, hey, yeah. this is this way. This is not this way. So if I could give one advice, it's just don't listen to people that use blanket statements. It's not good most of the time, right? We can agree Absolutely. on that. Yeah. So so you um you spoke about, you know, flowability, PRI. So most people know you as the FRC, Ken Stretch guy. Yeah. I guess we were, we were one of the first um one of the first practitioners in the in the yeah. industry before, you know, this thing like it took over. Yeah. Now it's really going uh, worldwide. And, um, you know, I've seen you Im implementing a lot of uh, flowability work and PRI. So could you educate us a little bit on those modalities? Maybe you can start with uh, flowability. Absolutely. So first and foremost, same idea as before. Like, when, I love how we actually led into this because I think the question before this is really important to talk about this. So the first thing that I'll say is uh, almost like a disclaimer is, I don't represent PRI in terms of me being, a, uh, um, you know, someone who's an expert in it. Um, I've been introduced to a lot of this stuff. They have like literally like, I don't know, 12 hours of free webinars on their website that you can go see. So again, go to the source before you're like, again, looking to me to teach you PRI. I tell that to my students as well. Uh, and then flowability is the same thing, man. Like, um, you know, what I, what my application of it is completely different. It's so different to the point that I, I don't call it flowability because I've had that conversation with them and been like, Hey, I'm doing something different than you guys. So like, you know, I'm going to do it this way and then shout you guys out and say, I learned principles from you, but this is my application and yours is different. Mm -hmm. So now that we got that out of the way, um, we'll talk about it. Basically, <laughs> I found that there was a really big hole in FRS. And I think the biggest hole in FRS was a learning how to calm down, learning how to truly tap into a parasympathetic uh, tone or state. Um, so, so basically what I'm saying is, again, the second point would be breathing, right? Um, we do maximum expansive breathing. So like, yeah, they tell you to do that. There's some breath holds, which are really great. Um, but there's just so many levels to how you can implement breathing, specifically even positional breathing to get better outcomes. And what I found over time is when I'm working with someone, I used to be like, all right, we're going to do pails and rails. We're going to do cars. We're going to do all these great things that do work. But I found that if I can get someone to calm down first and then they sleep better, 
and then they come back the next day and then I recheck their shoulder rotation and it's 20 degrees more and they didn't even have to do anything but learn how to breathe and go to sleep, mm. then why not go from there? And then right. instead of having to do pails and rails, having to do this, they're starting off so much further. And then you say to yourself, well, let me not forget my lens of FRS because just because they get there, I know from all of Dre and Trevor's rants that just because you're there doesn't mean that you can absorb force there. That doesn't mean that you can produce force there. Mm -hmm. And then to take that even a step further, that's where you get into the situation where I'm at now, where it's like, okay, so this person has adequate shoulder uh, range of motion, but I know it's not super strong because they got here from a breathing drill. They got here from relaxing. They haven't proved to me that they're really strong in this position, but does it make more sense for the person that wants to lose 50 pounds to say, hey, let's not do 30 minutes of right shoulder ER, and maybe we should just do some deadlifts and push the sled. You lose some weight. You keep feeling better about yourself. You know, it's like maybe we should just go to strength training. So that's another way that you can get so caught up in everything that you learned. I remember the first day I had someone, you're going to learn all your cars. I'm going to send you the routine. I was so hyped about it. <laughs> but the truth is, you know, one of the best things in our industry is the best program is the one that they do. So if I overwhelm you with all these acronyms and all this, and like you came to me for 40 pounds of weight loss and to feel better about yourself with some, a little bit of shoulder pain, like maybe I need to readjust my, my, my way of thinking about it. So the other thing that, you know, PRI and flowability really brought to my mindset was the relationship between the rib cage and the pelvis. Whereas when I finally, when I meet people and I start working with them, it's brutally obvious that they don't know how to put these things together, that they don't know how to make them work as a team. And you see that in your cars, right? So like show someone how to do a shoulder car and tell me that they didn't lift their rib cage up as soon as they got past their, their, their shoulder for shoulder flexion. Like it's guaranteed. It. Show someone a hip car and tell me that they didn't just throw their pelvis in their low back room. So instead of saying, oh, well, you know, we're just going to isolate further. I try to say maybe it makes more sense for me to make these things work together, which again, Again, like going past your, your, your guru, I mean, independence before interdependence. Well, personally, what I've been doing lately is I'm not trying to break up your spine. I'm not trying to break up your pelvis. I'm not trying to break up your rib cage. I'm trying to put those things together so that they work well. And when they come together, it's crazy what happens at the shoulder and the hip. And it's, it's, it's almost like laughable in a way to, to go back to saying proximal stability before distal mobility, but yo, that shit is true in my opinion. And when you get that stuff to work together, you get them to really truly create some intra-abdominal pressure. A lot of those aches and pains and those limitations that are at the extremities, they kind of go away. And to me, like we said about loading, there, there's no getting away from learning how to calm down, learning how to sleep. Those things are prerequisites that come to, to me before shoulder rotation. And when you get really good at giving someone those prerequisites of learning how to breathe, learning how to relax, you actually oftentimes get the prerequisites of the shoulder. So in a lot of ways, I talk about it like it's chess versus checkers. If I can get you to get all three of your goals by doing one intervention, and it maybe even gives you something that you don't even know about. People come to me all the time. They're like, yo, I stopped. Uh, you know, I don't have the hiccups anymore. My stomach's not so irritable anymore. It's weird. I didn't even change my diet. Great. You just learned how to breathe. Oh, my nose isn't clogged up anymore. That's weird. I feel crazy. My, my aerobic capacity is so much better. You know, And again, these are things that I don't think that Dre and FRS is not saying, but they're definitely not prioritized when I learn the system in that way. So for me, I'm trying my best not to say first day, can you move every little segment of your spine? Like, hey, can you just keep your ribs down for us for like five seconds to do anything? And that, that would be a great start. So those two systems have really helped me a ton in that aspect. Mm -hmm. So so breathing is a big part of uh, both systems, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's huge. It's huge. Restoring your breathing, both in terms of um, expansion, getting air to the spots that aren't getting air. Um, because that's really what happens. And, and, and the, again, this is kind of cool because Dre and FRS are talking about this because they teach us, hey, before you go crazy on someone's pinky finger or their wrist or their elbow, you should probably look at their shoulder blade. And before you look at their shoulder blade, you should probably look at their spine. Right. But before you look at their spine, you should probably look at their breathing. So it's another step beyond that, because right. when you're able to get airflow into a certain part of your rib cage that isn't getting it, oftentimes your spine, oftentimes your shoulder actually lets go. And a lot of that excess tension, whether it's neurological, mechanical, whatever you want to go into, 
oftentimes it'll actually go away. And, you know, seeing people like, again, it's a gray area because it's not necessarily our job, but we were learning from them anyway, like seeing someone like Loke who's integrating multiple systems and, um, you know, putting those things together for better outcomes. It just makes too much sense to me that you wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. no, I agree with you. There's always a list of priorities, you know, and uh, yeah, you should always start with, you know, first things first, like you said, and I think I've played with breathing um, for a few years as well. Um, I think, you know, they kind of, you know, it's the new thing now in the fitness industry, breathing through your nose. And I've experienced some, you know, good results. I just stick to the basics. I just don't go deep into the woo-woo shit. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it, it works. You know, I'm, the only thing that, um, that bothers me, quote unquote, bothers me is this world restore or kind of, uh, you know, hitting that reset button. Like they speak a lot about that, especially when it comes to posture. So I'm just curious to know your thoughts on this. Like, what do they mean by uh, the reset button? What What's the reset position? What is it uh, based on? And who decides what the reset position is? Are you speaking f kind of specifically about flowability and the way that they use the reset button? Is that what you mean? Well, I heard a lot of, yeah, I heard a lot of the flowability stuff, you know, um, you know, around that, that topic, I guess. But I, I believe that the PRI um, practitioners speak about that as well. Yeah, I think the reset, um, although it's, it, that's a tough thing, man, like just how you already know, like, you know, science is so complex and we're so complex as individuals and we are individuals. So to, to, to use words and language, it, it, it ends up having to be a reduction. So it loses some, some of the, um, the kind of details and, you know, reset's a tough word to be honest. But I think essentially what's happening is you're trying to get someone out of the, the patterns that are not helping them, that are holding them back. And I think mouth breathing, the, like, just like you could find twice as much research on why mouth breathing sucks compared to twice as much research on FRC. And I think that they both make sense and work together. So getting someone to like learn how to truly get through their, their breathing through their nose, get out of their mouth breathing, learning to teach someone not to belly breathe, but to get expansion into their actual rib cage. Um, in terms of flowability, you know, they're really changing even the way that you sit, which is super counterintuitive to, uh, to FRS. I totally get it because it's like we're yeah. told nonstop. There's not one, one way to sit. But what you need to realize is there's probably a best way to sit. And that's what flowability does is they actually teach you how to sit with your core and with your ass so that you're not sitting in your lower back because we know from physiology from even FRS, what you load is going to get bigger what you load is going to get stronger what you load is going to have a better representation, better afferents better contractibility, it's going to be used as a dominant thing so right. when I pro program we're not computers but for another reduction program myself to sit in my lower back all day it's not a coincidence that when i go to use my hips and i go to deadlift i use my lower back too which again isn't the end of the world you're not going to die but that system is built on really creating um you know an autopilot of loading your hips staying out of your lower back tightening your waist getting tighter in the front in terms of creating intra-abdominal pressure and stability um so it, it is counterintuitive but i've had a lot of success with it too and it, it makes a lot of sense to me that basically to sum it all up frs is all about giving you movement options right but a lot of these systems are geared towards giving you the best movement option to start and you can go wherever you want after that you can do cars you can do end range you can do all this but like does someone have the basics and can you even walk well first before I go worrying about 40 degrees of hip rotation? Because although we say it all the time, you need this, you need that. The truth is, dude, there's a lot of people that are never going to need 45 degrees of hip rotation in either direction. Mm -hmm. It's just the truth. You know what I mean? And like, there's a lot of people that aren't going to need straight leg hip flexion, like up to your face. It's just, you, we might not need it. And if it's your goals, then we need to give it to you. And there's nobody better than that than FRS. But like, again, like similar to like what you talked about the other day in your story, where you're talking about like, you know, a lot of people want to train professional athletes, but you don't realize that even the ones that are doing it, they're probably making most of their money off of general population. And it's just realistic that way. But when you meet someone from general population, like, dude, they could care less about how much hip rotation they have. They want to be able to sit without pain. They want to be able to walk well. They want to be able to feel good. They want to be able to breathe well. And then they want to look good. And a lot of those goals, 
you know, FRS isn't the fastest way to get there. And to me, like I keep saying, it's really all, all about a blend mm -hmm. of everything based off of the individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So you see, uh, you, you spoke about the lower back situation. Um, obviously, I, I spoke to Karan. I did a session with him, my first uh, uh, flowability you know, introductory session. And, um, you know, I just have a hard time wrapping my, my head around the fact that you shouldn't be uh, moving your lower back because uh, that's what he said, right? You see, she should Crazy. be moving the yeah. stuff above and yeah. below. And I'm like, why shouldn't you be moving something that has the ability to move? It, to me, it's just so counterintuitive. Yeah, but you could take the same thing and say, okay, um, when you do cars, when you do a shoulder uh, car, why are you not allowed to move the front of your rib cage? Why are you not allowed to tilt your rib cage upwards? Because well, you're adding constraints. You want to see how well you can isolate one part. So then that's just a constraint to keep you right. out of your lower back and keep you into your hips. That's so. that's what I found interesting. And that's what that was my main takeaway, I would say, from the flowability stuff. It's like, oh, I can use it as a strategy so that people that mainly move from the lower back, uh, I'm gonna have them kind of, you know, uh remove that out of the equation and say, okay, now we can really focus on the hips and the upper back. But besides yeah. that, I just don't resonate with the fact that the lower back shouldn't be moving. You understand? Yeah. You, you get my point? Um, you have no idea how much I get it, dude. I've been yeah. deep yeah. in this thought process. Trust <laughs> right. me, it's, it's tough, man. You know, like it took me a while to get on. I literally, the reason I was on a podcast with Karan just to argue about all the things I've argued jo about Jordan with. Like, exactly, I literally exactly. Did. Just be, and that's, that's, and I think like, again, bringing it back to how you started the conversation, like this is such a great moment for anybody listening because A, you were curious. What did you do? You literally went to the source. You did a session. You did exactly what you always like to learn. You felt it. You questioned it. You probably argued about it just like I did. 100%, <laughs> did 100%. Yeah, you know what I mean? And then what did I do? I, I literally argued with like the creator of it or at least the second person. <laughs> I, I argued with Karan on a podcast in public. You know, like you have to dive in and you have to really go at it and challenge your thought process. But what, what I can say is this is, you know, the same way that you're saying, hey, your hip has to be a hip and your lower back has to be a lower back. Your lower back doesn't flex your hip. So why are we training your lower back to flex your hip all the time, which if you actually, that's the other thing about the lens of flowability is they're so they, they pinpoint the shit out of it. Just like when you get good at FRA and you see these little things, like um, uh, if you're familiar with FRA and you're listening, think about like your face down prone and Shivers is checking knee flexion. But before he checks knee flexion, he opens up your lower back, pulls your shirt up puts his hands on your erectors and sees when your erectors turn on to actually start to initiate your, your knee flexion. So right. you're, you're really thinking about pinpointing things. And when you take slow motion video of the way people are hip hinging, there's movement happening in their lower back. And most people don't ever get out of their lower back by really connecting the front line and closing. I strongly believe from watching people, especially working in the gray rehab area setting, like, dude, people come in and they have no ability to close their ribs on the front. They cannot exhale. And your ribs actually begin to maladapt. So it's like they adapt in a, 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 a negative way because when you're open in the front and your ribs are like that, you can't close them to get IP. You can't close them to get that stability. And you're just going to keep running into these, these compensations over and over because that's what I did for years. I said, oh, I don't need that. I don't need that. And then I had people doing shoulder cars and I was like, why do you keep lifting your ribs up? Like how many, how many foam rollers do I have to put on your chest so that you don't lift your ribs up? But it wasn't because they, it was something was missing. And that's what I, what I started adding those systems for. And it's honestly been a game changer. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, it's funny, you know, because uh, <laughs> I, I kind of argued as well with uh, Karan. You know, I was like, <laughs> I know we're, we're the same, man. I got yeah, you. yeah. I listened to the podcast as well. So that, that actually leads me to the next question, but you kind of answered it. But how, how do you blend those modalities that sometimes have opposite philosophies? You know, because I like, you know, I like to use the, 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 the Bruce Lee, um, you know, theory. You kind of take whatever you need. And you just Absolutely. remove the stuff that you don't need. So how do you go, like, if you could give us, because I know a, a few um, coaches and therapists are going to be listening to this, like, what would be your uh, best advice to create your own system and blend all those different modalities that might seem, you know, that might have opposite uh, theories? Absolutely. So the first and foremost is it's always the individual. It's always got to be based off of an assessment. So when I see someone like 
usually it's super obvious, like, all right, cool. Um, like for example, um, Alex, Alex is a, a fellow Ken stretch instructor um, from Bermuda. She's one of my clients right now. And in order to, to improve all of her cars, all I did was improve her ability to shut down the front of her rib cage, get everything locked in and all of her cars got better. A lot of her outcomes got better and she stopped feeling anything in her lower back and it changed completely. So everybody's an individual. The assessment is going to guide you. Same thing that you would hear from, from FRS, specifically FRA too. So what I do is I do an FRA with everybody. Like when you're working with me online, even you go through an FRA, you film it so that I love cars just even as a baseline. So even, even if I'm not going to give you elbow pails and rails, I know week one, this is how your elbow is able to rotate. So week 12, without working on your elbow, I say, all right, let's reassess. And you say, wow, my elbow looks better. My knees look better. My ankle, like crazy. We didn't even do anything on those. And I go, yeah, no shit. You ready for another 12 weeks? And I'm like, definitely now, you know, I've just seen it. So it's really, a matter of like again going to the individual establishing baselines is really really important but in terms of blending everything i'm really going to start at breathing in the rib cage first i'm going to start thinking about how they're how they're sleeping because if i give you all this tough stuff and you don't recover from it you're just going to run around in circles or be going in the wrong direction mm -hmm. um for me, I do have people still do cars. I definitely, um, you know, will have someone do some pails and rails, but it's honestly really rare, which I know is crazy to hear um, for everybody listening. I'm sorry uh, if that disappoints you, but uh, for the most part, I'm trying to get people to strength training as soon as possible. Um, a general week for me with my clients is people are going to do like a flowability based session um, two times a week, uh, maybe one time a week. I'm very different than them. I'm not saying, not that they say you can't do anything anything else, but there is a push for you to hit the reset button like you're talking about and just do flowability for a while so that this stuff fixes itself. So you change your structure. So what I try to do is say, hey, we're going to do two times a week. That way you're not bored of just breathing in the power cat and the vertical plank all day. Uh, we can also still work on your heart rate. We can still work on your strength training, that kind of thing. And we just do it in the same lens that you would program for someone based off the FRA. If you can't get overhead, guess who's doing the landmine press? You can't do a landmine press because your shoulder's that bad. Guess Guess who's doing a push up, you know? So you're still going to integrate that strength work. Um, I usually have a PRI based session that's um, one or two a week, also. And then I'm going to have like a really good strength session. If someone gives me six days, I'll usually give them two. And I always encourage everybody to do aerobic capacity, mm -hmm. um, especially zone two, working out first, all nasal breathing. I think that that's unbelievably great. And another thing that so many people probably don't even know that Dre and all them preach about. And they're like, oh, you just make contortionists no actually they're talking about your heart health a lot you just didn't hear it um, and then the last thing that i would say about that is education is so important so essentially when you look at flowability and you look at the application of it most people are going to notice the big butt and the natural curve in the lower back and i like to think about that the same way that you would think about posture same that way that you would think about anything it's on a continuum meaning i need my client to be able to posterior pelvic tilt and i need them to be able to anterior pelvic tilt and I want them to have all that spectrum under control and an option at any moment, which is literally FRS, right? Mm -hmm. So the way that I'm going to teach it is I'm going to make sure that they're educated so that the one day that they're not getting any posterior pelvic tilt, their back is completely in an arched kind of natural curve the whole day. And then the next day when we do PRI and I say, hey, you know, those hamstrings that you just stretched out yesterday, tuck them under you now and now find them in that way. Mm -hmm. And it's it's confusing and there's always questions, but just like anything and just like how you work with your clients, you got to educate them and you got to bring them to you know slowly arrive at the big picture because mm -hmm. the more they know the more they see the big picture and where they're actually headed the more that they're going to buy in, in my experience mm -hmm. for sure for sure and you know i feel like at the end of the day it all comes down you know to creating more body awareness i think it's about that man and whichever tool you can use just use it breathing if it helps you you know um, getting rid of certain compensations, just just do it, you know, and I, that's how I see it. I feel like body awareness is the most important thing. Even when I strength train with my clients, uh, you know, I do a lot of uh, uh, bodybuilding, bodybuilding style with general population. I feel like it's very, very valuable. And I really have them focus on, you know, this kind of mind muscle connection. It's an old school concept, but y'all, it's so real. It's so real. Just focus on the stuff you're trying to recruit and you'll be able to develop that stuff and just know where you are in space. This is a game changer. So, you know, I feel like it's it's super important. And you said something that um, <laughs> resonates so much with me. Some people, they, I've been mentoring a few coaches and I know you have as well. We, we'll touch on that. Um, 
you know, they take the FRC course and then they, they only want to do mobility stuff with their clients and their clients, they come, they want to lose 20 pounds. And I'm like, Hey man, you can't do that. And I feel like, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, but the, the dude doesn't have a wrist, doesn't have a shoulder, doesn't have a hip. It's like, yo, yo, that's not what they pay you for. <laughs> that's not yeah. what they pay you for. They don't give a shit about cars. And so you just got to be smart enough. And I feel like this is the art of programming. You know, you got to learn how to, how to put things together, you know, how to blend everything your knowledge so that you can uh you know give uh what you know give to the client what they want but also what they need in a small way you know they don't see it coming it's like oh in a few weeks okay they lost 10 pounds and, and they're like oh my back feels way better i don't feel back pain anymore i don't feel knee pain anymore and that's what you know being a trainer is about i don't know if you agree with that but I 100% agree with that. I think that that's I think that that's so necessary, and I would even love for them to say that at FRS. Yeah. That would be amazing if they said, yeah. and they could do it real chill. They could just say, "Hey, you know, if your client's 75 pounds overweight, maybe lay off the pails and rails for a second. Exactly. Find a bike, find a sled, find something very safe, and have them lose weight." Because one of the things that we might not know everything about pain, but one of the things that we know is that there's a huge uh, psychological and neurological component to it. Mm -hmm. So when you have someone who feels better about themselves a month later, they mm -hmm. probably care a lot more about losing 10 pounds, seeing the scale move a little bit, feel their breathing improve, feel their sleep improve, just feel like they can get more work done than maybe how hyped up you are about five degrees of hip IR. If you go <laughs> a month and you got five degrees of hip IR or you lost 10 pounds, like who's getting rehired? I'm getting rehired <laughs> exactly. time and time again. Yeah. And I don't even work with weight loss clients. And and I think that that's another thing, you know, FRS is so amazing and they give you such knowledge that should be taught everywhere. Honestly, I think everybody should learn how to breathe. Everybody should learn how to move their joints and like some of at least the basic physiology, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you talk about all the time. And, and, and what happens is when you get all that knowledge, it's so easy to just get tunnel vision and get lost in it. Yeah. And, and what happens is people are coming to you not to uh, have the best wrists in the world, not to have the best elbow in the world or the, even the best hips in the world. World. they're coming to you to feel better to move better and and when you start your session off which is what the fra kind of is without especially without good communication and you just say well here's a really long list of all the shit you can't do you ready to start training <laughs> that you think that they're going to be hype about it of course not they're going to be like hey man i was already fat when i walked in and now i got all these joints that don't work and what do you want me to do listen to you and like we said the best programs is the one you do guess who doesn't exactly. do the program is the guy who's doing and mobility work but he needs to lose 70 pounds and can't breathe you know yeah, like right, right, so right. so that's a, that's a crucial thing to be said i'm glad you brought that up yeah yeah for sure i hope y'all taking notes <laughs> so dude i want to transition here um and talk a little bit about your digital development uh because uh i have to say man like you have uh, been inspiring me you know you've been putting out good content and uh actually i remember when we started following each other you know, you have, you have, we had a few thousand followers. I remember you and Zach, uh, you guys were the main ones. And, uh, and you know, like, then I see your following growing, growing and growing. And then I see these two motherfuckers move to Miami. And I was like, shit, this shit works. I gotta get on it. And for those that don't know, I'm the last techie guy on earth. So I'm like, fuck, I'm just posting weird shit. I don't know anything about algorithms, uh, you know, hashtags. I don't know shit. Like literally, I don't know shit. I speak French, English, uh, Portuguese. And I'm like, I don't even know which language I should use, you know? And I see my guys killing it, killing it literally. And, uh, and you know, so I just wanna, you know, um, you know, if you could take us through this uh, digital journey, did you have to uh, hire people? Are you still doing one-on-one -on -one sessions? You know, like how, how did it work? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, man, it's, uh, you know, one of the biggest things and uh, I think you can still see Zach is definitely still killing it. Obviously, he's, a, he's amazing. He's one of my good friends. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the F FRS was huge, man, like, I'll never forget how they've helped us in terms of, you know, reposting, I might not get any anymore, but I used to and it definitely really helps. So like, yeah. If you're early starting off, you know, that's definitely something worth going after. Um, uh, you know, at a certain point, I think it's really important and probably nobody else will say this, but like, you got to realize that you're promoting your business and not their business. So maybe keep that in mind. Whereas if every post is just to try to 
promote FRS and it's never to really promote yourself. That's not really a long-term strategy. Uh, so I think that's important to really mention. Um, another thing that I really messed up that was one of my biggest mistakes is you have to know who you're talking to. So like, that's one of the biggest mistakes I see every single day. And especially in our community, mm -hmm. if you are talking to a general population and your goal is to increase your people in person and online, why are you trying to show Dre that you know how to explain <laughs> FRC? <laughs> That shit doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? I, and I did that for years. And now if you look at my posts, it's like, hey, this will help your hips. You should try it. Maybe exactly. tag a friend, maybe exactly. save it. I don't know. <laughs> try this at your next lower body workout. Right. And you know what? You know what works? That works, man, to yeah, get yeah, the people. Yeah, because yeah. I, I had a lot of, I my followers have completely like almost halted, but my business has completely grown. And I'm perfectly happy because that's the outcome mm -hmm. I want. You know, mm -hmm. obviously I want to get more followers and it definitely is connected and will help. Um, but ultimately you got to figure out who you're talking to and then you got to talk to them instead of trying to talk over them. And right. that's something that everybody makes the mistake of yeah. the acronyms, this you're, you're done with the first paragraph and you're just confused or even better. You got all these trainers that love you. And they're like, man, this is awesome. This guy's so smart. I love your stuff. I'm not going to buy anything from you, but <laughs> you're great. You know, and it's like, all right, cool. Well, I'll just be broke over here and everybody yeah. thinks I'm smart. And I've also made uh, functional range systems about a million dollars at this point because they've also <laughs> exactly. been sold. You know, it's like, all right, great. You know, so that was really awesome to start my career. It was right. awesome. I, I, again, I still feel indebted to them because they've, they've taught me so much and I'm happy mm -hmm. that I was able to give back in certain ways. Um, but you do need to separate yourself at some point and you do need to really be talking to the people that you want to talk mm -hmm. to. Um, in terms of where, where we're at right now, my brother is a huge part of my success. So I'm not going to really talk about it as if I'm the game changer, to be honest with you. Uh, I like to joke and say I'm the talent, but I'm really chopped liver when it comes to, you know, all the stuff we're talking about. Um, my brother's a videographer and photographer, so he's able to be the person who, you know, everybody always tells us your website's awesome. I'm like, hey, man, did nothing. All I did was like that cool stuff running up the sand hill. And that was it. That's all I did. You know, so like Alex has done all that. So I'm for, for super indebted to him. So finding someone that you trust, someone that you can work with, um, being long term, not trying to do it all yourself. Obviously, if you're starting off and you get on Wix and you get something going, that's better than nothing mm -hmm. because that's how it started for me, man. I mean, I always tell this story to, to people. So many people have the imposter syndrome. They're so worried about posting something. The truth is, man, like so many people don't know how to do a reverse lunge. So whether I care about your reverse lunge post or not, doesn't matter because I'm not going to pay you. But that one person that does, they're going to learn something from your reverse lunge post and they're going to end up signing up with you at some point or they're going to start following you and eventually get to you. So, so I think, you know, just pulling the trigger and just doing it and just figuring it out along the way is so important. So many people stop themselves before they even start. And I think that that's really clear and you can kind of think about it like, you, you, I mean, you talk about this all the time, like you got to be willing to both fail and win and you got to be hungry. You got to be willing to go after. I mean, in New York, like the time that you're talking about where we met, I spent every single weekend on that nasty ass turf in that physical therapy clinic filming by myself while everybody else was doing stuff, you know? So you just got to put in the work and be consistent. Definitely take advice. At this point, we, we have a marketing team. So like we have like a, some guys that we pay monthly. It's not even really expensive. It's like four or 500 bucks and they basically take care of everything for us and then we do like a video call with them and they explain some of the, the metrics we're getting how we can change some things um, I think the newsletter is really important so starting a newsletter is really great because we are at the mercy of the algorithm if you don't um, meaning like Instagram can hide all your posts so if you have your whole entire platform built on Instagram something happens to Instagram guess what like dude you're screwed you know so having a Facebook group that you build up because you put something in the Facebook group, everybody sees it. It just goes right to them. There's no way it could be hidden. Um, same thing with your newsletter. It's a direct plug right into that person. Um, it's a longer format too, so you can add a lot of stuff, even like a monthly update. Like imagine, think about all the value that's in the FRS newsletter. It's crazy. Like, mm. dude, you read through that, you want to get smarter, read the FRS newsletter. Mm. So like you have something of value like that and it keeps people coming back and you're really able to kind of uh, you know, know your market and also be able to talk directly to them. That's super interesting. And uh, are you still doing one-on-one face-to-face sessions? Yeah. So I do some sessions in person. Um, I was actually, I'm working at a place called Intuitive Interventions and they do a surgery alternative um, where basically um, 
they actually have like what's called scar map and it's a, a an ipad right in front of you and it's an ultrasound so say i go over your elbow and it shows you the different lines of connective tissue so they'll be able to see disorganized connective tissue on the actual ipad like seeing it live and then they put a syringe right in it and actually shoot a placenta based like amnion fluid that breaks up the scar tissue right in front of your eyes so it's basically like all the stuff we've been complaining about for years that people are telling foam rolling does, you literally do what foam rolling does, but right in front of you. So they do that on the left side of the uh, office and then they come to the right side and then I'm the one who gives them the movement solutions that guide the healing process. Mm. So that's a lot of what I do in person. Um, we get you know famous people and athletes. So it's kind of a cool thing for me to do. And I, I don't have to do a lot of the other busy work. I just kind of show up and I'm like, hey, I'm here. All right, I'm here from 11 to 12. See you now I'm gonna go work on my stuff. So I think it's good to have like different things. I see different populations that way. I also do training in person out of somewhere um, on uh, somewhere called Train uh, Fuerte. Um, but I just don't do as much of it as I used to, mostly because of Corona. Um, but I think the perfect schedule for me would be to work in person from somewhere between 10 to 15 hours a week. That would be ideal. Mm -hmm. So what does your routine look like? Because I've, be, I've <clears throat> been transitioning a little bit. I'm doing more digital stuff. Um, at some point, I was doing a lot of it. And uh, and then I started missing the you know missing the the, the 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 human contact and and I was like okay now I stop I'm going to reduce the amount of, of clients I'm training and I'm going to go back to personal training and now I want to transition again so I guess it's kind of kind of a cycle but what was funny is that I didn't take that corporate uh, route because I didn't want to sit all day you know uh, I didn't want to be in front of my laptop uh, the whole day. And bam, a few years later, here I am <laughs> sitting, yeah. you know, just having a desk job like any, you know, uh, you know, off, like any other office job. So what does your uh, your routine look like and what do you do to, you know, maintain your health or your, you know, fitness, should I say? Yeah, it's um, it's honestly a shit show, man. Um, it's different every day and every week. Um, I, it's kind of surprising for people when they see my programs or they see my, my courses and stuff. But like, I'm super disorganized. Like, I, I have ADD like crazy. Like, my shit's <laughs> all over the place. So, uh, you know, scheduling is just like really low on my my list of strengths. Like, it's <laughs> meaning it's not on my list of strengths. So my schedule is pretty open. But that's kind of the cool thing about it too. Is um, you know, I think the biggest thing that you got to learn, especially as an entrepreneur entrepreneurs to try not to stress um, because it just adds to the equation negatively so like when you can't do something you can't get something done or even when like when I tell my clients like oh man I had my sixth workout of the week and I didn't finish it I'm sorry it's like dude chill the fuck out you're gonna be all right take the next day off take today off do whatever you want to do and you're gonna be fine the next day so like the biggest thing I can say about scheduling and and, and overall is just to really not stress about it because it just adds into the pot negatively that you just don't even need um, but my schedule for for me keeping myself healthy I go for a walk every morning i'm fortunate enough to live on the beach in miami so i go on the boardwalk every morning um, i'm putting uh, i'm listening to the oxygen advantage right now book i put my my airpods in go for a walk do a little zone two it's really more like zone one but you know whatever it's the same thing uh, and then uh i pretty much do like for myself i'll probably do two to three um flowability sessions a week, maybe, maybe more so two, and then do like a good uh, breathing routine or like a little bit of the main stuff, like a little bit every day. I lift probably two days a week. I'm trying to play basketball three days a week um, and, uh, and, and anything else on top of that. But in terms of scheduling, man, it's all over the place. Um, I just kind of roll with it and just try not to get frustrated if it doesn't work out perfect. That's dope, at least people can, uh, you know, hear that you human as well because they see oh, people they get you know people they get shit done sometimes like oh they work so much etc and it's good to hear that you know you just human and you just go with the flow when you can't do more you do more and sometimes you just do less and that's how it works so yeah, um I play a lot of fifa too man you know I'm just oh like, yeah? yeah oh yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a video game guy. I'm not a video game guy. So yeah, I, won't, I won't challenge you. I won't challenge you. Yeah, you're down with the Mbappe though, right? That's my guy. Oh, He's that's your guy. Yeah, yeah. You saw it yeah. like, I don't, so what, you, you, do you watch uh, soccer? Uh, I don't watch it, but I, I play it. You like, play. And that's, <laughs> Fair enough. I know, I know that's disappointing, but it's <laughs> the enough. truth. But man, uh, PSG is probably the best team in the game, and, and uh, Mbappe is the best player in the game. So yeah, he's a, he's a killer. This kid is a killer for you sure. You gotta get him on your roster, man. That's that's oh, the next man. Person. Dog, I live like literally like two hours away from them, and uh, I'm trying to get Neymar. You know Neymar, the Brazilian uh, the Brazilian player. Hell yeah. 
he's always injured and shit. And I'm like, dog, I can't help you, son. But, you know, like, it's Did hard to get him? to them. Say that again? Did you DM him? Dog, you try, but this guy's a superstar. It's like, it's impossible. No, no, I know, I know. But you just got to shoot your shot. Like, hey, man, yeah. like, I've been DMing this motherfucker, like, every yeah, day. Yeah. Like, yo, I can't so help I, you. I sent you your program. Did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> yo, he's like, I don't even know who you are. Nah, yeah, they, no, man, he's like a super, superstar. You yeah, know, so yeah. soccer is huge, you know? Like, yeah, uh, it's like reaching out to Chris. I get it. It's like reaching out to Cristiano Ronaldo or LeBron same, James. Same level. Yeah, Cristiano Ronaldo. Try, and that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, we gotta try, but you know, we oh, never yeah. know. Let's let's speak it into the universe. We never know. So, so my my dude, what what is your next move? Are you working on some new projects? Yeah. So right now, um, honestly, just refining all of our old ones. That's another thing that I would say that would be really important for for people uh, in terms of businesses. I think it's really great for you to have more long term projects than always trying to create something new. Um, because then you can build on it. Like for example, the EVM, which is like my subscription platform for like kin stretch classes or whatever, like, like, man, I could stop today and I'm super confident that that shit would be valuable for years. Like there's so much stuff on there. So like, it feels great to be able to like build into that and not necessarily need to restart something every time. Um, and then with our course, Mobility Coach Plus, which is what we use for our coaches, I try to, sorry, a bunch of people are texting me. I, I try to um, get that to be, it's crazy, man. It's like, I'm constantly learning new stuff. And like the person inside of me is like, dude, I have to go restart. I have to go add it. I have to add this. So like, it's, it's a never ending project. Um, but new stuff, I do want to team up with one of my, uh, my good friends and create like a, a, a speed program where I kind of do some of the mobility, um, strength and recovery stuff. And he does more of the sport, sport specific speed work. Uh, that's definitely something I wanted to do. I really want to do more stuff with athletes. Um, honestly, I find it, um, yeah to be really, really fun. Like a lot of, some of the athletes I'm working with, I'm working with some pro soccer guys. I'm working with, uh, you know, a college basketball player. And like, you know, it, it just the athlete in me really enjoys it. I think it's all about balance. Like we talked about earlier, where you're going to have gen pop and you, I really enjoy working those people too. But, you know, seeing your guy play in an actual yeah. game, like it's tough. To, that's, that's, a, that's a feel that I will be happy to have forever, man. You know, yeah, so yeah. I love to have more of those moments. Yeah, for sure. Training athlete is cool. I, you know, like any other trainer, we, that's, the, that's the end goal at the end of the day, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. so you, you will for sure. You're killing it. And I, I know they, they be creeping on your page. I know. I know how they do. <laughs> so I have the, the special K, uh, K-Swiss show question. Um, if you could spend one night slash one moment with one person of your choice, celebrity or not, who would that be and why? Oh, I like that. Do they have to be alive? Nah, that okay. yeah, dead or alive, you choose. Okay, I'm going Kobe, hundred percent. Um, Kobe, no, I, grew up, I, I grew up idolizing him. Um, you know, he he just has meant so much to me in my whole life, and. Uh, I'm not one of those people who's like, yeah, you know, I have the Mamba mentality. Not that there's people that don't have the Mamba mentality, but I feel like I have so much respect for him that, uh, that like, I I'm okay with having 75% of it and just grinding mm -hmm. and realizing how great and how unbelievable he was and just being happy with it. But it would definitely be Kobe. I would definitely hoop with him. I would definitely get a big ass steak. Um, I would definitely uh, maybe go see a game too. That would probably be my, my day plan right there. And then maybe drink a little bit too. I probably have some some fine vino or something, you know, kick it like that. <laughs> dope, dope. Kobe May Kobe, rest in peace. So my guy, where can people find you? Uh, you can get me on Instagram um, at Ian Marco. So that's I A N M A R K O W. Our business page is my name Marco M A R K O W Training Systems. Uh, the website's the same thing. So MarcoTrainingSystems.com. Uh, anybody can reach out, man, especially any questions, um, anything they want to know. I'm more than happy to talk to anybody. So always feel free to reach out. Dope. We'll link that in the show notes. And uh, last question. Can you say something in French? Oui, oui, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Dope. My guy, thank you very much for your time, for sharing your expertise with us. That was, uh, I really appreciate it, man. Okay. Thanks, bro. I appreciate you. All right. Peace.